Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm joined today by Dr. David Menton. He's our staff anatomist. He gives us lots of uh, workshops and education on the way our body works and functions. And you've been doing that for a couple years, right? Yes, I was on the faculty of a medical school for 34 years. I've taught some gross anatomy, primarily microscopic mm -hmm. anatomy, and, and some research. All right, so today our topic is the muscles in your body and how they work. We're going to look at three different types of muscle, and we're going to start out today over here on this model. So we're going to come around the table and talk to you about the way your body works. Now, we've mentioned this in other episodes. This is Claude, and he's our, he's our lobster. He doesn't have an internal skeleton, but he has an exoskeleton on the outside. So his muscles are inside, and they pull on the different things in different ways. So he's got an exoskeleton. You, as a human being, have this structure over here that we call an endoskeleton. It's inside of our body. So the way that our skeleton and our muscles interact with one another, we call the musculoskeletal system. And this model here is, of course, a skeleton of a human, and it's got all these interesting markings on it and different things that Dr. Menton is going to explain to you. Well, I guess the first thing I should point out, it, it's a model of a human skeleton. It's not a real skeleton, uh, but it uh, is uh, very similar, very close. Uh, have you noticed certain skeletons have a paint job like this? might have wondered, uh, are they being patriotic, red, white, and blue? <laughs> This is a convention uh, in teaching skeletons uh, to show where the muscles attach. So everywhere you see a blotch of paint, there is a muscle attached there. And you say, perhaps, well, why red and blue? What's the difference? The, blue, or the red is what we call the origin of the muscle, and the blue is the insertion, like when you insert a coin in a bubblegum machine, insertion. And what's the difference between the origin end of a muscle and the insertion end? If this were a long, slender muscle, and we have muscles like that in our legs, uh, one end is going to be origin, one end insertion. Uh, the difference is the origin is the end of the muscle where it attaches to a bone that usually doesn't move. Okay. So the origin is like an anchor point. Right, it's an still. anchor point. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I can make my arm go up and down like this. Uh, the muscle that's doing that is up here. Where it attaches is not moving, but where it attaches down here, that's moving. Okay? So the origin is the non-moving end, and the insertion would be the end that, under most uses of the muscle, uh, is doing the moving. Uh, let's use an example of a muscle you're all familiar with, the biceps. That's the muscle in the arm here. Now, it's a good thing I'm wearing my lab coat today because I don't want to have to scare everybody with my That's big right. muscles. <laughs> <laughs> but the biceps muscle is called the biceps because it has two heads. That's what sep stands for here. Bicephalus, Bicep. two heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, on the front of our arm, the biceps muscle, uh, the two heads are attached up here, one to this little uh, process coming off the shoulder blade, and the other uh, sort of on top up here. We have a long head and a short head here that to go up to this area. Uh, when we move our arm uh, like this or we bend our arm, uh, we uh, are not moving usually our shoulder. Now, if we were doing push-ups, and I try to avoid them, <laughs> but if we were doing push-ups, we could kind of reverse <laughs> the origin insertion activity. But let's stick with normal use. The other thing we have to say about muscles and bones is muscles, skeletal muscles, are attached to our skeleton for the most part. I'll give you some exceptions. They're attached to our skeleton. They allow us to move. Our ability to walk, our ability to sit, our ability to do just about everything. Think how much goes on in a brain that has to be sent out uh, by motor nerve fibers to our muscles to allow us to do whatever our brain says we should be doing, standing, walking, even talking. Uh, so uh, if you're going to move bones, I've got a little rule for you, and this is going to be just plain duh, obvious, but it's important. A muscle must cross a joint to move the body. 
let's say we had some mysterious muscle that was attached from here and it went down and attached here. That would accomplish what we call a bunch of nothing. A whole bunch of nothing. Yeah, that would be a waste. Of There's no movement that can happen <laughs> if it's not across the joint. Right, so mm -hmm. we don't have a muscle like that. Our biceps is really uh, helping us to move up here at this joint because it crosses this joint, but it also crosses this joint down here. This, by the way, is a universal joint. We can do that with our arm. And uh, uh, this joint down here is what we call a hinge joint. It's sort of like a door. It goes this way, but uh, it doesn't uh, go really any other direction. We call it flexing when we bring our arm in. We call it extending when it goes out. So if you're decreasing the angle of a joint, you're in doing flexion. You're, if you're, you're flexing. increasing it, you're doing extension. And, we're doing, and there's a limit to that extension. You can only go just so far. And that's built into the joint here. Uh, we have this interesting little hook-shaped end of the humerus here, or of the uh, uh, ulna. Ulna. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes into a little socket or hole. And uh, that limits how far our arm can go. If you so go it's like a that, stopper to... you would put on a door hinge to right. help it from going too far. Mm -hmm. And uh, we call it a fossa, that little dip there. And so notice there's a blue spot right there. What does that tell us? What was attached there? Remember, the blue would be the... That's the insertion. Insertion part, the part that moves. And uh, the origin is going to be red. And the muscle behind is similar to the muscle in front. Only this one back here is called the triceps. Wait a minute. I bet it has three heads. It has of three heads, right. yes. I'm getting this stuff. I'm starting to figure it out. A lateral, medial, <laughs> and long head it mm -hmm. has. And these uh, attachments are, you can see uh, uh, two of the attachments right here, this big area uh, and this area up here. And the other one is attaching up here. So uh, we have a muscle that is behind that hooks on here. Its tendon would go around the bend here. And when we contract the triceps, we extend. When we contract the biceps, we Your flexion. Pull up. Mm -hmm. Now, now that's, that's awkward. That's making me hurt. You've got his arm oh, right. around there. Okay, there. Now that looks more comfortable. Right. <laughs> but Make it was, it was obvious to see. to see there. Okay. Okay, now let's look at this insertion. It's interesting. Uh, this biceps muscle came down and it inserted right here where you see the blue. And there's a kind of a bump there. The bone is enlarged. In fact, in general, when muscles attach to bone, bone builds up mass to keep the muscle, the tendon of the muscle, from being pulled out. Mm -hmm. So we call that connective tissue piece on the end of a muscle a tendon. Yeah, so any time a muscle is attaching to bone, that's tendon. Right. If we've got bone to bone, that's called a ligament. That's a ligament, mm -hmm. right. It's not, it doesn't involve a muscle. And so we have a tendon that is attaching here. And when this muscle contracts, you can see if you pull here, uh, that would come up. Now, this attachment could be real close to the hinge. It could be further away. We'll show you the importance of that in a bit. But before we do, here's something you may have experienced and not understood what the basis of it was. When you do pull-ups, we usually grab the bar like, like this to do the pull-ups, OK? That's bad enough. <laughs> Try doing it this way. Grab the bar from this side and pulling up. This is harder. Why is that? Let's look at where that, bi and the biceps is doing a lot of that effort to mm -hmm. do the pull up, okay? Remember, it's going across the shoulder as well as across here, so it's involved in the whole thing. Uh, if we have our palm facing up like that, that's the way it would be when we grab the bar like so. If we grab the bar the other way, we grab like this. We can take Yorick here and put him into that position. This is his palm that's up right now. And we uh, rotate him this way. To go in, yeah. So this in. that motion's called pronation. Pronation mm -hmm. brings it in. It's now palm down. So if our palm was in that position, that's the left arm. I guess I should show maybe with the right. If our uh, palm is down, like that, and we grab the bar, notice what happens. Going from palm up, 
Let's get it back to palm up again. Palm here. up again this way. Mm -hmm. Here's our insertion. Here's the tendon that's attaching. Let's uh, let your finger be the tendon, okay? okay? Keep your finger there no matter how painful it gets, right? Watch what happens when we go from palm up to palm down. We pronate the hand. Can you get over here? It's got to rotate that. Oh, I'm twisting that muscle around. His finger is getting pulled in like a clothes wringer. So you see, when we're on the parallel, or when we're on the chin-up bar, if we're this way, our muscle has a straight shot to what we call the radius. That's the bone here. This is the ulna over here. It comes down directly to the radius, and we have a direct pull. But as soon as we take our hand and go this way to grab the bar, the radius makes a 180-degree twist. I think that's probably why they call it the radius, because it's that's rotating. That's right, because it's, uh -huh. it's, it's the rotating got a little wheel the on the end here mm -hmm. that helps it to, uh, uh, to rotate. See there? A regular little wheel at one end. So that makes that motion a lot more challenging and takes a lot more energy to perform. Right. All the time that you're hanging on the bar like this, uh, your muscle is saying, or your hand, oh boy, I wish I could just flip around this way. <laughs> It'd <laughs> be relax. so much easier. So much easier. Than to have to pull your body up uh, with a muscle or a tendon from a muscle mm -hmm. wrapped halfway around, 180 degrees yep. and bone. Well, you can see there's lots of other attachment places for all the muscles of the body. And uh, some of them cross one joint, some cross uh, two. And... Uh, they move the bones of the body. Yeah. So those Let's are... look at some of the physics of what's involved. Remember back here, the biceps attaching? I mentioned it could have been closer or further away. Okay. What is the advantage of that? So we've got a model here. We've used this model before in one of our previous episodes. But basically what we're looking at is we've got the um, origin up here. It would actually be up above the joint. But for this model, it's here at the top of this representing the humerus. And then this is attached down here on the radius. And it takes a certain amount of force. I've got some weights down here to represent something that you would be lifting with your hand. It's going to take a certain amount of force to be able to pull this, depending on where that insertion point is. So the origin point is going to stay the same. This model would actually allow us to vary that as well. But as I pull on this to get this weight to come up here in that first position to 90 degrees, it's maxing out my scale. It's taking a lot of force. If I were to move this down to this middle point, make the insertion farther away from the joint, it's going to give me what we call mechanical advantage acting as a lever. And so now my scale's reading about 800 grams, where before it was well over 1,000. So it's taking less force. So what do you predict is going to happen if I move it out even further into an insertion point that's farther down away from the joint? Move that loop down there. And it should get easier because our lever, the distance from our resistance to our force is being moved. And it's under 600 grams of force to lift, or of weight to lift that up there. So we can see that these different points of origin give us a different mechanical advantage. So um, evolutionists have argued that this is a bad design mm -hmm. because if it were further down, it would give us a, a better pull on our, on our forearms. But that's not necessarily the case because there are other things to consider and right. factor in there. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but imagine if the tendon in our muscle here attached out here close to our wrist way at the end. You'd have a, We'd have a big, big uh, fold of skin out here. Right. <laughs> On the other hand, as you do move the attachment point back towards the fulcrum, uh, you're, you're requiring more force, but you're getting more movement, faster movement of the, mm -hmm. of the limb. So it's kind of a trade-off of how fast you want that limb to be able to move this way. So it's an engineering, engineering design problem. to be able to decide which one of those is more important. Okay, so we've talked briefly about skeletal muscles, but you're going to go through a little presentation here and talk to us about the three different kinds of muscles that we have in our body. Yeah, just before I do that, I'd like to just play off this term, skeletal muscle. We have 45 muscles in our body, approximately, that are not really attached to the skeleton at mm -hmm. all. Guess what they're attached to? And they're voluntary, mostly. Muscles of our face. There's about 45 just in the face. 
In order to smile, you can't just use two muscles. We do, in fact, have a muscle here and a muscle here that can pull up, okay? Mm -hmm. And I am now going to give you a two-muscle <laughs> smile. Okay, everybody ready be good. for this? This will be a little scary now. Ready? That's not very That's smiley. That's not a very convincing <laughs> smile, is it? It's said for a genuine smile, it requires approximately 20 muscles. This would even include the eyes. You know, a lot of us are wearing masks these days. <laughs> and uh, you have to kind of look at the person's eyes yeah. to get whatever expression you're going to I get. I found myself smiling at people as I walk by them in the grocery store, realizing they can't see my lips. <laughs> What's but happening there? But you know, there? they can tell by the eyes that, mm -hmm. there's, a, that there's a smile there. Uh, we have a muscle in our neck here called the platysma. It goes from our chin here on down. And if you're shaving, you use the platysma <laughs> to tighten the skin of your face to shave. Isn't yep. it great that the Lord gave us a muscle just to tighten up the skin for shaving? It is a great idea. So uh, I should point out that these muscles are, of course, involved in facial expression, which is very complex. And facial expression is a full language. Mm -hmm. Babies in the womb have facial expressions. And... Uh, you can go to any place on earth. You can go to some remote tribe in the jungles of Peru, maybe, that maybe haven't seen anybody outside of their own culture before. They will recognize a smile. They will mm -hmm. recognize a frown. They can see anger. They can see happy. And uh, so think of it. That was the language that did not get confused at the Tower of Babel. <laughs> that language has persisted on through today, and what a wonderful language it is. There are people who uh, get a damage to the nerves that supply those muscles. It comes out from behind the ear here. And uh, during uh, delivery, sometimes with forceps or something, you can pinch that nerve. It's called the facial nerve. It's a good name for it. Isn't yeah, it? that's a pretty handy name. It comes name. out like this, uh, branching uh, to all the different muscles of the face. You even have six muscles just to move your ears. One up, one forward, one back. And there again, you think, uh, do the ears really have to move? Oh, we've got all kinds of muscles. We have a muscle right here. I, I always remember the name of this muscle. It's called the mentalis muscle. Uh, <laughs> it mentin means chin, I believe, in French. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the purpose of this muscle? Put a dimple in your chin. Would life go on if you couldn't put a dimple in your chin? I think so. I've got a little tiny one. It's not very prominent. <laughs> Kirk Douglas, he made a career out of a dimple in his chin, a movie star. But think of it, these little subtle things, they're nice, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. And when you lose facial expression, and sometimes it's just one side, and it's, it's a tragic thing. People yeah. have difficulty communicating. Mm -hmm. Well, that's skeletal muscle, and you see that not all skeletal muscle is skeletal. Most are. We've already learned that, uh, well, that was in another class we taught, uh, that skeletal muscles, while being voluntary, we have control. I don't just sit here and all of a sudden my arm starts going up, you know. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? That would be. Uh, our muscles that are voluntary can be automatic or involuntary. A good example is breathing. If we had to think of every breath we took, we wouldn't get anything else done in life. I'd get distracted and forget to breathe. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure of that. And yet it is voluntary. Hey, everybody try this. Just inhale. Now exhale. You're under control. But what if that were the end of the story? Every breath you had to think of going in and out. That would be a torture unlike anything we could imagine, and yet we take that for granted, don't mm -hmm. we? Well, that's skeletal muscle. The smallest skeletal muscle, by the way. <laughs> Can you see how tiny this bone is? That's the littlest bone in the body. It's shaped like a stirrup. It's from the middle ear, and uh, it weighs one ten thousandths of an ounce. And uh, it is by far the smallest bone in the body. These three are small. They're the only bones that don't grow after we're born. But uh, those little bones have the smallest muscle, skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. It's called a stapedius that attaches to that little stirrup. And when sound comes in from the air and goes to where the cells that do the hearing are, those cells are basically in water. And yet sound is in air. And when sound goes from air to water, we lose a lot of energy. It's what we call an impedance mismatch. And we wouldn't hear anything hardly if it weren't for those little bones that restore that. But have you ever been at a ball game where somebody sits behind you with one of these air horns? <laughs> and every time uh, they're, usually at a basketball game this happens, every time their player makes a point, mark on the air horn, 
Well, the Lord knew there would be idiots like that. <laughs> and so that littlest muscle in the body, the stapedius, dampens these little bones, the little stirrup especially, so that it doesn't overload with doesn't that sound. sound. And this happens before you hear the sound. Yeah. Well, let's look at the three muscles of the body, if I can take the point. We've talked about skeletal muscle. They're voluntary and they're syncytial. Oh, there's a new word for you. Skeletal muscles result from the fusion of a lot of separate muscles. This happens in the development of the embryo. At first, they're called myotubes. And we have a reservoir of cells that can make more muscle fiber, and uh, they're called satellite cells. So uh, uh, a skeletal muscle, like in your leg, could be three or four inches long and could have over 100 nuclei from about 100 different cells that fuse together. So this is unique to skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle, typically one nucleus per cell, occasionally two. Smooth muscle, one nucleus per cell. But skeletal muscle is a whole, uh, we call a syncytium. And skeletal muscle fatigues. Even this little stick, if I hold a stick up for a while, I'm going to eventually have to put it down. <laughs> because skeletal muscle is great for, you know, like conducting the orchestra, but it's not great at just sitting and, and doing something all day. Smooth muscle is perfect for that. So you know what the Lord did for our eyelid? He gave us one skeletal muscle to go around winking at folks. And he gave us another smooth muscle that attaches to our eyelid that holds it up in the long haul so it doesn't droop. Well, I'll tell you, the Lord thinks of everything. Cardiac muscle. That muscle is only found in the heart. So we have a heart here. Mm -hmm. uh, if we open it up, well, that's got a smart when you do that. Uh, right here, this is the muscle in the wall of the heart. Unlike skeletal muscle, it's not attached to the skeleton. And uh, it's a muscle that doesn't fatigue when it contracts intermittently. So we call it a twitch contraction. Uh, it can do that not just for all day long, but for your whole life. Think of it, one heart pumping away for your whole life. In a lifetime, you'll pump three super tankers, these things that haul oil across the ocean, three of those full of oil, uh, that much blood you're pumping in a lifetime, and you only get one heart. So uh, we really have to take care of it. So cardiac muscle, like uh, smooth muscle, is involuntary. We don't think about it. It has its own built-in pacemaker, so you don't have to have a nerve supply going to the heart. It'll beat regularly without any nerve at all. That's why you can transplant a heart. If it requires nerves, you can't really transplant it. So you can't transplant an eye because you'd have to cut the optic nerve and never get it hooked up again. Uh, but if you don't have nerves going to your heart, it doesn't up and down regulate. So if you do exercise, it will just keep on going its uh, normal rate. Uh, so that is not an ideal situation, to say the least. Uh, and it's non-fatiguing. And finally, smooth muscle, it's involuntary. It's the kind of muscle you have in your intestines. Ladies have it in their uterus. And uh, our whole GI tract, our intestinal tract, uh, from our pharynx and larynx, all the way down to the anus, all the way through is a muscular tube, 18 to 20 feet long, and it's all smooth muscle. There are fibers that go longitudinally down the tube, like that, and then there are fibers that wrap around, like that. They're in two different layers. And they kind of alternate, and so the tube gets shortened, and then it gets squished, shortened, squished, and this goes right down the whole length. We call it peristaltic contraction or peristalsis. Well, what is the difference in these muscles under the microscope? Here's skeletal muscle, and we oftentimes call it striated or striped muscle, and you can see why. Uh, when they're stained with certain dyes, you wouldn't see this if you didn't stain it under most conditions, but when we put a dye in, we can see that there's a banding pattern. And we call these repeating units in here sarcomeres. We'll show you what they're like uh, when magnified. From here to here is one cell. Another name for that is a muscle fiber. So a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. But remember, a skeletal muscle cell formed from lots of separate cells that fuse together to make a giant cell. So there could be 100 nuclei in here. But look where the nuclei are. They're out at the edge. It almost looks like they're not even in the cell. This is a nucleus. This is a nucleus. That's a nucleus. This is very clever because this protein in here is contracting. And if that nucleus were down inside the muscle, when the muscle contract, the nucleus would get squished. It'd look like an accordion. 
that happens in smooth muscle where the nucleus is inside the cell. But here in skeletal muscle, the nuclei are in the periphery, and the muscle's free to contract without having any nucleus get in the way. Uh, let's look at the next uh, model. This is a, what we call the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. This is believed to be the way muscles contract. Uh, not just skeletal, but cardiac muscle, and in a somewhat similar way, even smooth muscle. What do we mean by sliding filament? We have something that's a thicker filament like this and a thinner filament. There's little mechanochemically active cross bridges that kind of scoot along like that. It causes these two filaments to slip in relationship to one another. This would be myosin, this would be actin. And there would be six of these thin actin filaments around one myosin. So you see that here. This would be a myosin filament. The thin one would be an actin filament. And from here to here is a sarcomere, and that's what gives the banded look to cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. When the muscle's relaxed, the thin and thick filaments overlap by just a little bit. But when it contracts, you can see there's a limit to the contraction. It can only contract until the thin filaments bump into one another. So uh, uh, that's true of striated muscle, both cardiac and skeletal. Smooth muscle pulls a little trick that allows it to contract a lot shorter from its rest length. So we call this a sarcomere. There's the word from here to here. And this is the unit uh, of contraction uh, for muscle. Uh, how much strength would you have when your muscle is pulled out like this? Your strength based, is based on these cross bridges. How many of these little cross bridges are working in here? Not very many when the muscle's straight and stretched out. But as the muscle contracts, there's more and more cross bridges involved, and you get more and more strength. Now, you can test this one. Uh, go to that bar we were talking about before to do pull-ups. Try this. Pull until you're halfway up and stay there for a little bit. That takes a certain amount of effort. Now, start from this position with your arms almost parallel to the floor and pull from that up to the chin up here. Which is easier? The from here to here is easier than from here to here because of the amount of overlap we have in the starting condition uh, of these muscle fibers. Uh, we have one more here, yeah, we have. We're gonna have to move through this one quickly. <laughs> cardiac muscle is banded, but notice the nucleus is in the middle and it gets squished. And cardiac muscle branches and where they attach, we have these little lines here called intercalated discs. They're just the attachment points of cardiac muscle. And finally, smooth muscle. This is smooth muscle like we'd have in our intestine. This would be one muscle cell here. Notice one nucleus per cell. And you notice how twisted these nuclei look? That's because this muscle is contracted really powerfully and it's caused the nucleus to get turned into a little, we call a corkscrew nucleus. How is muscle, smooth muscle, able to contract so much shorter than skeletal? It's because they don't have the sarcomere arrangement. They have the thick and thin filaments. Here's myosin, actin, myosin, actin, myosin, actin, myosin. But notice this is like a drawer in a file cabinet that pulls out its full length. Uh, one drawer goes in the next bracket, like that down the line. So a unit this long can contract uh, very, very short because we're not limited to the length of the sarcomere. Speaking of sarcomere, do we have time to talk about our model? <laughs> yeah, here? so let's come into this model here. This is one of the um, units of our skeletal muscle. So if we could take a cross-section of a bicep muscle, what would this piece that we're looking at right here represent? This would represent one muscle fiber. So when I was showing in the screen up there the, uh, the picture of the muscle fiber, so what it's, we're seeing it's here, that long skinny tube with all the pieces inside of it. Okay. Yeah, and it would be one muscle cell. Okay, so, so you one, wouldn't see this with your eye. Yeah, this is one cell with all these little fibers inside of it. And all of these are where we have those bands of the actin and the myosin, and they're interacting together inside of there. And they're, I think about it as my fingers sliding together and contracting like this, as right. you showed in that. And there's that, a limit, isn't there, yeah. when we go together? And you they just can can't only go going. so far. Yeah, And that's why we can only contract our muscles so far and so tight. So if we think about the way this is structured, another way we could envision it is with this piece of rope 
So if we had a muscle like the biceps muscle, it would have a whole bunch of those muscle fibers together in right. one bundle. And those are all pulling together. So maybe we have thousands of muscle fibers that are all working together to make the muscle itself. And inside of each of those, if we could come in here with the camera and we were to cut inside of the one of those, we'd actually see, and this is called paracord, it works as a great model, you can see the outer sheath of the fiber, and inside of it are individual little strands. Each of those strands would represent the myofibrils that are here inside of this muscle cell. So that adds strength to the muscle itself, and it provides uh, the, the elasticity that we get from muscles and the way they're connected inside of one another, the contraction and the, um, all of those things that happen are very uh, crucial parts of our body functioning. If this didn't work the way it did, you wouldn't be able to move your body in all the ways that you do. You know, it's a, an element we often don't think about is calcium. We think its main function is for bones and it's uh -huh. certainly important there. But we couldn't contract our muscles if we didn't have calcium. Yes. The whole contraction mechanism is based on a nerve coming to the cell here. Now, this is one cell, just a piece of one cell. It would be really long. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called a motor end plate here. And this is an axon, a nerve axon. And electrical discharge goes across here that depolarizes the membrane. And when that happens, the signal goes into these little tubes. They're called T-tubules. And that carries the contraction impulse into the cell. Mm -hmm. So the signal, instead of just being out here on the surface, uh, it's going right through the cell around every myofibril, every sarcomere. Yeah, so, so every time you're regular. contracting your muscle, we're sending electrical signals that cause a chemical reaction. There's a reaction between that, uh, the myosin and actin, and there's ion exchange. So the key ions that we're talking about there are calcium and sodium and potassium. Mm -hmm. So if your muscle were to cramp, what happens is that ion exchange gets blocked in some way. There's not enough of that ion that causes the relaxation effect and that muscle stays locked in place. It can't create that electrical potential that you were talking about across that membrane. Have you ever had a muscle cramp before? Oh, yes. <laughs> is it a pleasant experience? No, it's, it, 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 the best thing you do is like if it's in your leg, it's where I get them a lot, Yeah. is to try to get the legs straightened out and yes. it straight for a while. If you keep mm -hmm. it bent, it just makes matters worse. Yeah, it can <laughs> cause a lot of uh, pain. I get them in my sartorius across the inside of my thigh, and that's a hard muscle to stretch a lot. So if you get a cramp in your muscle, the best remedy is immediately stretching and massaging to increase blood flow and then taking um, electrolytes, specifically getting potassium. So a lot of people eat bananas because that's high mm -hmm. in potassium. So things that have lots of sodium and calcium and potassium in them help our muscles uh, keep that electrolyte balance to be able to function. That calcium is stored. You see this lacy material around each myofibril? This would be one myofibril. This lacy material is called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And calcium is stored there. And when a wave of depolarization from a nerve fiber firing comes down, it causes that calcium to be released. And then the actin and myosin filaments mm -hmm. slip past one another. Yep. And notice, this gets crazy. This whole thing's a fiber or one cell. One cell. And that's a myofibril. Inside of it, like inside. we saw the little strands inside a, of the rope. And then inside of that are little dots. Those are the filaments. <laughs> yes. The myofilaments. So we have a myofiber, myofibril, myofilaments. And when we get down to myofilaments, we're talking about something we really see at the electron microscope level yeah. and down. It's not easily seen yep. in the light microscope. So all this engineering, the larvas made here is very small. By the way, here's a, uh, this, there's connective tissue around the surface of this muscle cell. So every muscle cell is wrapped in connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And then there's bundles of muscle cells that are wrapped in a thicker amount. If you see, when yep. you look at a piece of ham, the little white rings in yeah. there. So we would think about that if we had a sheath around this rope. Right. There would be connective tissue with connective tissue and layered up in bundles. Okay, so you can see how amazingly complex just the muscle system is. And of course, we've really only scratched the surface of all of these things. And it's just another testimony of God's amazing design, the way he's created our bodies to be able to function and a way that we can understand more about him and give him praise and glory for that. So until we see you next time, get out and explore all of God's amazing creation.